Hi, everybody. I started a little late tonight. I apologize, but I did it on purpose because, hey, Jay Bard. Hey, Bonnie Gillespie. Hey, Chris. Hi, how are you guys doing? I decided to, um, hey, Andrew. So good to see all of you guys. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you for the hearts. So sweet. I'm starting a little late tonight because I was watching one of my favorite people um, was teaching people how to say my name today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Rosalie Tenset. I know. It's so weird. It's Norwegian and uh, from the area of Tinset. But um, so it's Tenset. Yeah. Louisiana. Hello, Louisiana. Oh, thank you. I can't find my other glasses. I don't know what I did with them. I'm constantly losing them. So I'm, I'm wearing these tonight. They're, they're the other glasses, but they're a little crazy. So, um, but thank you so much for coming tonight. I started a little late on purpose because, um, Kathy Carey, who I adore, who's another, uh, filmmaker, she is, um, talk, she was talking on crowdfunding and she was on a roll, man. She was, she was rocking it, talking about crowdfunding. And since that's something that I have not done, um, she and I talk about it. We're like, Hey, do you want to do that? And yeah, I want to do this. Hello. Howdy, mini pearl. <laughs> so we talk a lot about, um, a, a different, different subject matters that maybe each of us could cover that one has more experience than the other. Um, she has made a lot of films. I've made, I'm not sure how many she's made, but she's won a lot of awards too. She has this wonderful film called Worth and um, I've made four films. And so I, I think I specialize in, hey, I'm a new person trying to get into making my own films for the first time. What are some things that you've done wrong that I could learn from? <laughs> So tonight we're discussing budgeting, how to go about with budgets on an indie film. And this is very important because, listen, there are some people, Bonnie Gillespie was talking tonight, one of my other very favorite people to watch on here. Um, she was actually talking about the fact that somebody made a film for $35. And the Duplass brothers, didn't they, they joked that they made the, uh, the couch film, I think for $300 or something crazy. You can have a budget of $35. Um, you can have a budget of $300, you could have a budget of $2,000, and you can have a budget of $10 million or more. So, um, yes, yes, on Netflix. Exactly. So you, um, your budget just depends on what it is, you know, what, how you're doing it, how you're shooting it, whether or not you are the writer, director, editor, <laughs> craft services. It's going to all depend on what your budget is. So I, I was just going to offer, um, hello, um, oral art house, art harsh, art harsh. Um, we are going to kind of look at what's called above the line costs and below the line costs, which maybe you might, hello, Charles. Hello, Charles. Um, maybe you guys might know what above the line and below the line are, but um, in case you don't, I'll kind of explain it just a little bit here for you. So above the line costs are um, your, your writer, your director, um, your actors, your uh, producers, all the, that's all above the line. And then they have what's called below the line, which is all the production end of everything, including um, your, your, you know, your DPs, your, um, your gaffers, your grips, um, catering <laughs> crew, your entire crew plus post-production. So there's a difference of, of, of how the budgets fall out. Now, what I did today was I actually, um, uh, was going to talk to you guys about some people that I have used for and location rentals. Yes. People that I have used to learn more about budgeting myself. Okay. I'm going to give you a little screenshot here and I'll explain then why don't you go ahead and get ready to do your, uh, your screenshot, um, with all these different places here. Oh shoot. It doesn't all fit on here. I'm going to back it up a little. I'm going to back it up a little. Go for it. Take a screenshot of that. I've put together a bunch of resources. When I, Put this on YouTube later. That's right. Closing streets or zoning. Um, when I put this all up on YouTube later, um, I will also put all the links here. These are different resources that I have used to learn more about budgeting. This is such an immense, hello, Alex. This is such an immense subject matter that it's, it's really too complicated to cover in um, a podcast. What am I doing? I'm doing periscoping. It's not podcasting. I, I do podcast, but this is a periscope. Yes. Okay. So, um, 
what I wanted to talk to you though today about is um, what first time filmmakers have a tendency to forget about when they think about budgeting, even that $35 film. <laughs> These are the things that typically people don't think about when they go and they think, oh, I've raised $3,000 for this. I have enough to pay my um, DP. I have enough to pay the gap or I have enough to pay for catering. But what they don't really think about are these following items. Um, let me get up my list of post-production. That's that's key. Post-production. Well, lighting is something you think about because you have to have your equipment, right? This equipment, people, and, and equipment is, is uh, a huge priority. But what people forget about with the equipment, and this is very important, is that insurance comes with the equipment. And most of the houses that you might rent that equipment from are going to require you to buy external insurance if they don't provide it from the company that actually... Um, see, I thought, this is my thinking, was when I went to go rent that equipment that the um, actual equipment house would also sell me the insurance on it right then. That is not so. So you have to think about um, getting insurance to cover all that equipment. Like we had um, a couple lighting units on this last film that we did that those those lighting units themselves were $12,000 a piece. So you have to, if, you know, you can have it for the weekend. You have to have some kind of insurance on it in case something happens because you might as well plan as well in your budget for things that are going to get broken because things are going to get broken. It's the nature. I mean, if something doesn't get broken, I don't know what you guys are doing, but you know, somebody's lamp in a house, something is going to get broken. And there's actually a place in most budgets to allow for damages, you know, that you put, you put aside for damages that it would not be covered by insurance, for instance. So post-production is one thing that um, people don't think about their editor some people don't understand that you're thinking, oh, I'm going to pay one editor and that's going to be enough. But that's actually um, a false thought because what happens is, yes, you, you hire the person who's cutting the film, but you have to think about your sound mixer or your, I'm sorry, your sound designer. The mixer is the guy that's holding the boom, does the lobs on set. Okay. The sound designer, which Kathy Carey talked about in one of her episodes, I'm not sure if she's archiving or not, but the sound designer is extremely important. I, like an idiot, didn't even know such a thing existed, but they will save your film when it comes to the sound. Um, it, yes, it has to be recorded beautifully on set, but things like doors closing. We had a dolly on set, and we did not have enough time because we were working with kids. Um, we didn't have enough time to actually go get WD-40, which we didn't have on set. What an idiot. Um, always have WD-40 on set. Can I just say that? I'm going to put in a plug for the product. Um, because the dolly was squeaking and I just had all these sound people. Oh, we can take that out in post. We can take that in a post. Well, let me just tell you right now. That was not an easy thing to take out in post. And, and a sound designer can do that for you. A sound designer will fix all of that for you. It is an essential piece of your film. Um, color correction. A lot of people don't think about this. We shot on a red scarlet and um, it doesn't matter what you shoot on. Um, if the lighting is one way facing one direction and you face it another direction, you know, the other direction, sometimes you're not going to be able to match that shot so that it looks like it's absolutely in the same scene. So you have to budget for color correction. I did not understand that my color correction was going to cost me nearly $2,000 after, you know, uh, shooting something on a red scarlet, but I had one scene that looked very gold old and then another scene that had this army looking green to it but that can be fixed with color correction so um and it didn't they were it was lit well it was the environment in which we were in they had these weird green lockers and there was the bounce there was nothing you could do about that so you have to allow for something like color correction um, people don't think about the festival submission fees and we talked about that a little last night in my last episode which is you know hey on average we submitted to let's say 40 festivals Yes, and if you try to color correct yourself, your monitor may not be calibrated. Thank you, Andrew, for bringing that up. You may think you're sitting there doing it, your color correction yourself with Final Cut, you know, 10, Final Cut X, or whatever you're doing, or even Avid, or whatever. But if your monitor isn't properly calibrated, when you get into a movie theater, um, the <laughs> All bets are off that your your monitor is not necessarily the judge of what your color your is really looking like. So, so you cannot trust that. Yes, Andrew learned that the hard way. And it's, so, you know, pay people or barter with them or get them to work for you on a back end deal, a percentage at the end of the film, something 
so that you get it done right. You'll be happy that you did because, and, 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 and maybe you aren't going to pay them up front. Maybe you can't afford, afford to pay them up front. Um, but you could, <laughs> if I incorporated today, the corp would be called WD-40 and duct tape. No lie, right? This is like my mother always says that when she dies, she wants a plunger and a paint roller on her grave. But <laughs> that's exactly it. WD-40. That's a riot. So, okay. So festival submission fees. I think we submitted to over 40 festivals on average. You know, some cost me $60. Some cost me $10, right? You make a periscope with that, Kristen. <laughs> um, uh, on average, I would say, let's say I'm spending $35 times 40 festivals. You have to think about that. I didn't think about that. I just, I don't know what I was thinking, but you have to think about that. You're, that's going to be a couple thousand, maybe a thousand dollars or something by the time you're doing festival submission fees. So you have to budget for that. People don't think about the travel that they're going to go to the festivals. When I went to LA and I had a cheap flight, but then I had to pay for three nights of a hotel. You know, the trip ran me a thousand dollars. So you have to budget for these. If you're going to go to the festivals, which you need to do if you're going to make use of them, especially the important festivals, the festivals with people who you really want to connect with. They have amazing workshops that possibly distributors might be at those festivals. It's not like you're not going to go. So you have to budget for that travel ahead of time. Posters, posters and postcards um, and all those travel receipts, write them all off. I mean, I'm the queen of that. And I highly recommend QuickBooks, QuickBooks. You don't even need Pro. I highly recommend it as a, as a program, though I'm pissed at them right now because they, my 2013 does not upgrade to Yosemite. So my whole computer is waiting for my taxes. To... <laughs> That's a whole nother subject matter. But QuickBooks, you can, you can categorize those receipts really well and coordinate with everything. I, I really do like the program. I just don't like their policies of not offering me a discount for upgrading. Okay, so websites. Have you thought about like how much you're going to invest in putting up a website for that particular film? And you're going to want one. We have a beautiful uh, website that I made myself on Wix. But it did cost me money to get the domain and it got me, you know, cost me money to um, upgrade it because I didn't want Wix's advertising all over it. But if you go to www.failuregroupies.com, you'll see that you can make a beautiful website on Wix for, uh, you know, but I, I'm sure I spent like $190 in the end to have it up, you know. So, I mean, you have to budget for that. And you're not going to want to just put the website in a lot of films, especially if they're tiny films, if they're, they're small, experimental, these are your first ones out of the boat, having a Facebook is fine. It really is. It really is. But if you're looking for, you know, to drive traffic to the future of all of your productions, like I have a separate um, website for Boy With Stick Productions than I do for failuregroupies.com. And again, it's uh, part of it's also the cleanliness of it, because if you're going to sell it and you had a limited liability um, corporation, which I talked about yesterday in the, in the, um, uh, we call this a periscope. Um, the LLC, once you do that, you know, having the clean websites is also good. It's just going to make a difference if, um, you, when you, if you could sell the particular thing, they, they just want to go to one website. Look at that. Look at all your laurels. You can put up all sorts of information, your bios. It's very different than Facebook. You can really, like, go to go to failuregroupies.com and take a look at how I have it set up. It's nice because somebody can really look at who the team is. Um, no, I don't think you missed a lot, Kathy. I, I, um, this is Kathy Carey. She is a terrific filmmaker. Swipe on her or click on her or whatever it is you do to follow her. She's amazing. She did a great thing on crowdfunding tonight, like part one, right, Kathy? You're going to do a part two on crowdfunding because there's so much to cover. That would be terrific. It was great. Um, press releases. I actually bartered for a press release or did I? No, no. In the end, I ended up paying, I think, $100 for a press release. But this was somebody who really should have charged me a lot more than $100. Yes, I can write it, but frankly, my time was very valuable at the time. So, um, and she also knew how to hook it up with all the different, um, what do you call them? Like, it's like a press conglomerate. You send the press release out to one place and then they send out the press release to the places that you're looking to um, have those press releases based on what film festivals you might be in. And those press releases are important. We got really nice write-ups in San Francisco when we were at the California Independent. And had we not had that press release and all that stuff, then, then when my director went to go to that film festival, there was already a little hype, which is really important. PR, PR Web, thank you, Kathy. PR Web, 
everybody write that down is good for that you know that you could you could um, do one press release give it to them they'll send it out oh thank you thank you can't find the other ones tonight so this is what we got um, drives to store the footage I don't think a lot of new filmmakers understand what it costs to buy um, G drives which are these big huge drives that you can get at B&H uh, if you're in New York that's where we buy our stuff here in New York is B&H um, and and B&H photo um, sells those G drives and they're like the four terabytes I looked them up today how much is a four terabyte G drive and it's $189 you're gonna need on a short film I had 12 and a half minutes I had two drives because you need of the first drive to put all the footage on you know all the footage at, or raid storage yes uh, I don't believe in anything being up in the cloud by the way I call me paranoid but I think if I talked to Julie Bush I'd be right about this that you know I, I don't put anything up it's you know hmm. Sony hack that's all I have to say about that okay then <laughs> If I get, if you get these um, Seagates, yeah, Seagates are good, but I will tell you that all the people that I was working with, they just insisted they were going to work with nothing but G drives because they're kind of the most reliable in the business. And you have to have two. What you do is you marry them, you you hook them up. Are they, what do they call it? There's a term for it where they hook them together and what happens is it goes to the first drive and then it automatically goes to the second drive so that you have the thing sinking yes and it, it um, so that you have two drives that you should live in separate houses like my drives one drives at my director's house one drives here and you have um, you have backup so if anything happened there was a fire can you imagine you put thousands of dollars into a film daisy chain that's it thank you thank you that's it's daisy chaining the drives and it automatically backs up that second drive. So you need, you know, those drives are expensive. That's my point. Okay, that's my point. Is the drives are expensive. So whoever's running your DIT station uh, will run that for you. But um, know that those aren't cheap. And I think a lot of new filmmakers don't understand. I didn't understand it. I had, I thought I was going to Staple for my drives. Okay, what have? <laughs> okay, okay. So then we talked about the insurance, and we didn't talk about um, locations. Turn out to always be more expensive than what you think they're going to be. Even the free locations will end up costing you money. Whatever you break in the house, um, you have to have insurance to cover them. Like we shot at somebody's house. I had to have insurance. My insurance covered the insurance on that house in case something happened at that house. People don't think about that. People don't, you know, I, I mean, if you're just going out with your iPhone and you're shooting something in your backyard, you know, go for it. But the minute you walk onto somebody else's property, you have to think about what you're doing. So, you know, note to self. Transportation. People, you know, I was thinking, oh, I'll go in my van because I have an Odyssey. It's huge. I'm thinking I'm going to go pick up a dolly. No, I'm not. No, no. I have to, I have to rent something that can pick up dollies. And that was not an expense that I counted on that. I, I couldn't carry that equipment in my van, even though originally the guys, all the equipment guys were like, it's going to be no problem. It's going to be new. It was a problem. So now I'm renting a van on top of, and, and by the way, renting a van for four days, not cheap okay so these are I this is school of hard knocks people this is why this is why Kathy and I are doing this because um we both are like oh man if I could save somebody else money pain and heartache pre-planning it you know we always rent a grip truck of course of course you rent a grip truck why wouldn't you rent a grip truck unless you think you have a minivan and you can handle it okay <laughs> so yes you're renting a grip truck that's it. And then you have to have somebody who can actually drive it. And in New York, that's different than in LA because in LA, everybody drives, right? But everybody doesn't drive in New York. Your crew members, they don't always, they're not always drivers. So you want to make sure you get one PA on set that is a driver if you're doing this low bow, low budget, okay? Um, deliverables. I, you know, I remember thinking, I was talking to deliver, I don't have any delivery boys, but there's this thing called deliverables people. And that is, um, how you're going to get those screeners to, um, the festival in order to screen. If they're tiny, little tiny, tiny festivals, sometimes they're using your H264 from your Vimeo and they download it and they do that. But yeah, you can use your minivan also for crafts. That's what we used our minivan for was craft services and the crew. Absolutely. Um, but the deliverables, I had to have um, Blu-rays made. Um, sometimes they want HD cam. Um, what's the other one besides HD cam, Kathy, that they want? 
and you know the minimum on getting an hd cam is like dcp thank you is like 300 dollars out here in new york it's different in la you can get it cheaper in la and i want to find out who those places are to get it cheaper in la because i don't still i still don't have a dcp online but you pro i think i ended up spending a thousand dollars in all of the deliverables that i did not count on um it just depends like kathy burns her own um CDs. I didn't trust myself to do that. I had a house do it and they did a great job. And I do have that source. I'll, I'll put that source up someday because they, they were fantastic. They were really good. And, and, and everybody talks about the quality of it. It's really great. It's better than neither one, my director or nor I could figure out how to do it and know that it was going to be a high enough resolution or, you know, have, have what it needed to be. So I just listen, if you're dumb like me, if you didn't go to film school, these are the things you end up having to pay for. That's all I have to say about that. Okay, so artwork, I didn't pay for artwork. Um, but if you print your own, if you do burn your own uh, DVDs, yes, Kathy, they have DVD burners. She's in the actual business of this. I may just be hiring you, Kathy, to do it for the next film. <laughs> but you can get you can get printers also that will print your artwork and your logos and all that stuff, right? So you have to think about that. Do I need to get a new printer to do that? Because that'll save me money in the end rather than having to um, be stupid like Rosalie and hire a house to do it. So, um, uh, okay by you. Excellent, Kathy. So these are some of the, can you think of any other things that people just don't think of that they're going to have to pay for? There's, there's just more than what you think of. Um, now, that said... If you're going to go out, which, by the way, I may do this myself, I may just go out with my iPhone, posters, posters, $40 a piece, staples. But once you start, okay, you think you got the poster once, but then what happens is um, you start getting in festivals like we did. Here we have these 23 laurels. I would love to, don't you transfer footage digitally. I'll explain that in a second. You think you have all of these laurels. You, once you get all these laurels, you want them on your poster. So that means uh, if you're not a graphic artist, you're not doing Photoshop yourself, you have to redo it and then you redo your posters again. Hello, Bamboo Goban. Hello again. Um, so um, you're not going to just print. You have a great place in New York where you get your posters. I'd like to know who that is because I've just had Staples do it. And now I need to have one with all of our laurels on it because, you know, who doesn't want to have that? Um, and so, um, what did I say I was going to get back to? Oh, Oral Art House, you graphic artist. Can you put my laurels on, on, on my poster for me? That would be cool. Oh, bigposters.com. Terrific. I'm going to write this down tomorrow. I'll write that down, guys. That's a really good source. What did I say? Oh, can you not, uh, transfer it? Um, yeah, Kate it asked a good question. Charles, where can we find you? Maybe put up your information so that people can see it. And then I'll put it on the YouTube as well. That would be great because the guy that actually designed my poster is actually in India, but he has his own film out right now. So he's really busy with it. So finding, finding another graphic artist, you know, okay. So can't you just deliver your film electronically? It depends on the festival. Sometimes you can, um, the festivals that are a little bit smaller and especially if it's a short, they will allow that. But once you get into being, um, a feature, no. I have not seen that they will let you deliver it digitally. It just depends. It really depends on the theater. Um, but mostly they're asking for, as a short film, they're asking for Blu-ray and they're asking for DVD. Sometimes they do ask for DCP if it's, if, if it's big. So, um, no. I mean, sometimes, yes but not always. So you have to allow the budgeting for that to be done digitally. Now, again, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of different places that are, are really great resources. And Kathy, maybe you can chime in here too for other resources you might know about. Um, in terms of like understanding and, and uh, yeah, you blur, if you have a Blu-ray burner, you can do it if you know what settings to do it. And, and Kathy would maybe be a good source for that, that, that could help you once you give her the digital file. But like I said, I, A, I didn't have a Blu-ray burner. B, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So that, you know, it helps to have some technical experience. And somebody asked last night, like, where do you get this experience? Well, there are different places and you should explore them and you should talk to the people that actually went to them to find out there, you know, people who go to film school are going to learn these things. I did not go to film school. I started as an actor, I, an actor and a writer, not a, a person that went to, um, and her husband is an editor. So that's why she's, you know, I mean, 
I didn't marry an editor. I married a guy in cold food truck storage. But he loves big, ballsy musicals. So, and he's really a hell of a crafty. So, you know, what are you going to do? Okay, so... <laughs> Yeah, uh, these are a couple places. This this particular place, this independent film school, like if you aren't going to pay thousands of dollars to go to film school, I use this research if you're East Coast. It's called the Independent Film School. Um, you can probably see that address there. Um, a woman by the name of Ila. No, she pronounces it Ila. Or, oh God, I'm just going to butcher it and just, it's so insulting. Ila Tear. Um, T-H-I-E-R runs it and she does a, produ a producer's workshop I think for a weekend that's like $250 and it's a screaming deal you walk away with a thumb drive of like every kind of template document that you could ever need I'm gonna yes I'm gonna I'm gonna hold this up again it's the top one the called independent film school and she does a weekend for producers and you end up with just an amazing amount of information if you've never produced before. She, you walk out of there with this thumb drive that has all of these um, uh, templates, which, you know, I would show you the templates, but honest to God, you know, they're hers. And she created them herself, and it was hours and hours. And for $250, for you to go to that producer's workshop weekend, and you will learn a ton. You walk out of there with that thumb drive of all these documents. It is a steal. It is absolutely a steal. This book that I showed you yesterday, though, too, and you can, by the way, you can look this all up online. I put that here, um, oh, at the bottom. Look at the film budget templates. Can you see the film budget templates? And the line producer um, connection workshop right there. Take a screenshot of that because this is what a line producer does, people. A line producer is the person that really comes up with your entire budget and tells you how you, it, it is worth it. If you're gonna if you're gonna do a if you're gonna do a film that's anywhere above eight thousand dollars, get yourself a line producer. And if you get hooked up with Ela Terre and her group, the nice thing about that is there's a bunch of people that are line producers already for commercials, different things, and they want to become directors or whatever. They will barter with you. Um, work on your films. You can work on their films. Uh, right. If you get a crew, they get to know a line producer. It is worth it to have a line producer because I can sit in here and tell you what mistakes I made because I did not have a line producer. Had I had a line producer, all of her films have been over eight grand. Well, I did three films for between four and five thousand, and then my last budget for my last film was supposed to be eight thousand. Twenty two thousand dollars later, I wish I would have invested in a line producer. Because the people that, you know, wonderful though they were, my director and my um, cinematographer, they were like, oh, we can do this for this, we can do this for that. They didn't have a realistic, at all realistic budget on the, um, she had no line producer, she did herself. But they, they had no realistic idea of what the post-production would end up costing. And that's, and I spent most of my money on my people, you know, on pe which is fine. You know what, if I'm going to spend it on something. I'm glad I'm spending it on people and their talent, but, um, editing, color correction, um, you know, the festival submissions. I'm just being realistic with you here. I will tell you that our film looks beautiful. It looks like something you could put on television now because I was a perfectionist about this one because the first three were experimental shorts. And I, I highly recommend doing experimental shorts to just get out there with your iPhone or whatever you have. Uh, and, 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 and do that first because you're going to really see then how to make a film, what it takes, where the problems are, where you really do need money in the end to do this better the next time. Um, and get in, But the post, man, you can't, you're right, Kathy Carey is right. The post is so important. And that's where I just, I just burned through money on post because I wasn't adequately prepared, which is one of, really is the reason I'm doing these these periscopes because if I could save somebody else from going out there and and not planning correctly for post uh, you always think oh I just need this money to get through this weekend where we're doing this shoot and you're not thinking about what comes after that 
And we all make these films because we want them to be seen. And the way they can get seen is if they do well in festivals. And so it's 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 really, really who there's Kathy's scope with you and your husband was brilliant. I missed that one. Is that are you posting these anywhere, Kathy? Are you posting all of your your videos anywhere? Let us know if you are. Um, so my point is go ahead and pre-plan because if you if you don't have it pre-planned then there are a lot of films and there are a lot of people um, that I know that started their films they got to post-production they just they just never finished them because they never came up with the budget for them and that that's just sad that just breaks my heart so um, uh, for sure you want to just plan for these things the other thing you want to do is go to workshops that will help you do that. Um, some different um, places that you can go to, Kathy mentioned tonight, Stage 32. Stage 32, which she mentioned is like the Facebook for film producers. Um, and I have have that also here on, um, is a place that offers different workshops. They show you different sources that have the workshops. Film Interchange, I love Film Interchange. They constantly have wonderful producers up there and they do these um, Tuesday night kind of forums um, in New York that are huge and they're starting to put all their stuff online and YouTube. Um, if, you, if you really are, um, IndieWire does great articles about people that have done it on no budget and Rain Dance, Rain Dance is in New York and I don't, do they go to LA, Kathy? I'm not sure if they do, but Rain Dance, um, is always uh, holding different types of seminars on producers workshops. You should go to them. Just get the research done before you go to do what you're going to do. Even if you're going to do it on a $2,000 budget or a $200 budget, you're going to know where you're going to be able to um, not skimp or barter or not barter. You'll hear the war stories from people and, and getting those war stories is what it's all about is um, how did you manage to do that on no budget? How did you figure it out? Well, if you've gone to film school and you have all those skills, it really helps you. But some of us have not. And especially for people who are actors that are starting to self-produce, which is becoming you know, prolific at this time, you need to understand what it takes um, in order to make a film that's really going to look nice. It's going to be something you're proud of. You're going to get great reel out of. And um, and you're, in the end, you are serving art, you know. And and you'd hate to put all that passion into something and then find out that it doesn't, it doesn't look good, you know. So budget for it and then you can, you can, you uh, um, and I'm just watching all these nice conversations going on between everybody else. This is wonderful. Everybody's making really wonderful connections. That makes me so happy. It really does because it's kind of like going to a film festival only on our phones. How cool is that? It's like making all these connections and finding people that can help you. And um, uh, the graphic artist designer, Charles, if you could like Twitter to me, I will put out uh, Twitter about your... Um, about your ability to do um, the, I'm sorry, what do you call it? See, this is, have I mentioned I've had a half a glass of wine? It's Friday night. This is what I consider. <laughs> this is this is Friday night. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Okay. No, no, no. I, I, I see you listening. I see you listening. But you should be connecting. This is, it makes me happy. It really does. So, um, Kathy's saying you can always raise money for post and a crowdfunding. It's easier when you have something to show. You know, this is really important because if, if you have teasers and sizzles, those sizzle reels and those teasers to show on like a seed and spark or on, um, or on, you know, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, you have got something to show that makes people go, oh my God, I want to see that finished. Oh my God, I want to see the rest of that. You can edit that yourself, you know, um, or, or, you know, it, it's, then you've got something to show for it than talking heads. You know, I always get really bored on myself with watching Kickstarter and Indigo Joe's, which is, I'm talking about my film. Well, because I don't have anything shot yet, right? But it's true that you can get money for post 
if you have something to show for it, if you're, if you're showing, I mean, that's the stuff that attracts my husband. That's his job. He's on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, and he, and he, and Seed and Spark, and he watches what's out there. And we occasionally will even just put in $25, $30 to a film because we want to see how is this going to progress? How are they going to run this campaign? It's a little, as uh, Bonnie calls it, lurking and leading because we just want to see um, how they're going to manage to raise the funds and the ones that have the sizzle reels, the ones that have footage already and they're like, hey, we were idiots. We didn't budget the last, you know, $8,000 for sound design and blah, blah, blah that we need. And, and you do go, oh God, well, I want to see the rest of this. You know, I want to see it with sound or I want to see it with music. Um, that's the other thing people don't budget for is music. Um, I think they think, oh, well, I'm just going to go online and get something free or whatever. And Kathy and I talked about this last night, actually, about how you can you can get orchestration done and you can get it done for a reasonable cost. Know that there's two different types. Um, estimates suck. Well, it depends on who is making the estimate. I mean, and how you talk with people and how you bargain with people and you say, listen, this is what it's going to be. I can, I can pay this much Sometimes they'll want a per day cost, like how much it's going to cost them per day, especially if they have to rent a studio to do something that's realistic. But if you could say, no, we have to cap it at this amount, um, that, that is difficult for orchestration. It is, but it's, it's possible to be done. And if it's somebody who's doing synth music, like they're doing electronic music, but it still sounds like it's an orchestra, that's always going to be cheaper because they're doing that out of their house. You know, they're doing that in their own studio at home. Um, if you want live instrumentation, you're always going to run the risk of that costing more, you know. So, oh, I always pay something as we start, but I never pay anybody the rest of it until it's finished. There's a little tip. Because all you need is them walking away from the project and not finishing it. Um, I've been lucky so far, but it's just because that's that's how I operate it. Also remember that you're going to be paying for people's travel expenses. Like um, we were shooting in New Jersey, so everybody, that all the people who came out of New York, um, if they took the train or whatever, you know, obviously I'm going to be reimbursing them their travel expense. Um, in rehearsal, like I did a, a rehearsal process with mine because I had kids. Um, and so I needed rehearsal um, with them ahead of time. And I wanted the DP and the director out there to see put them in their environment ahead of time. So of course I'm paying for the travel expense for them coming out from the city each time. Unions, um, you know, I'm only working right now with non-union crews. There's no way I could afford a, a union crew. So right now I'm working with a lot of people that are fresh out of NYU, fresh out of Columbia, um, that are looking to build real themselves. So I'm not paying union fees for a crew. However, um, when it comes to SAG, that's a whole nother night. Maybe I should do a whole nother night on SAG, Screen Actors Guild. But you can do, I list all four of my films were under Screen Actors Guild's agreements and to this day nobody's been paid. Because if the money, if the, when you set up that, um, the unions do not ruin it. The unions do not ruin it. The, the SAG after will work with you. They are, it's paperwork. That's all it is. You get online on SAG.org and you do the, um, you can do it. You can file it all. They actually call it a zero budget film. What I, what I was doing, if it's under $50,000, they call it either a micro budget or a zero budget film. So if the film makes money later, I pay my SAG actress a hundred dollars a day. Kathy Carey always pays her actors. I, I have to think about this. The ones that were not my students, the adults I did pay. I paid them a daily rate, but if the money eventually, if the film eventually makes money, then I will pay them each. The way the agreement is, it's $100 a day. This 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 film is not going to make money. I'm fine with that. I never intended that to happen. But I, of course, I didn't intend to spend more than $8,000. And then, then now look. So, but it's led to it going to a feature. So that's how you get names. What do you mean by that, Kathy? That's how you get names. I don't know what you mean by that. Are there any other questions? But why do you need the unions? Are you talking about the SAG actors? Are you talking about the actors or the crew? See, I, I'm not working with a crew, so that's um, a crew that's union. But in LA, 
a lot of crew people are union. In New York, there there are union crews, but um, for the crew, but um, I, I haven't, my crew is non-union. What do you mean unions, period? Oh, you mean in general, like you're having a political discussion about it? Oh, well, I thoroughly believe in bringing in the SAG union. It has been uh, beneficiary to me and it will be, it has been very beneficiary to my son. So, um, it protects, it protects him, you know, as a, as a child actor and it protects me. And, um, it's been, it's been very good. It's helped paid for this film <laughs> with my commercial jobs. I was lucky enough to get three commercials last year. So it's, it's helped paid for this film. <laughs> And, you know, I don't like somebody taking my image and using it a million times and they're getting the profit from me, but I'm not. And that's, as far as I'm concerned, bullshit. So I like the union. <laughs> Your crews are union, but not in the position I hired them. Oh, the, and that's, that's a really interesting point. Like if they're a union member in one thing, but then they're not uh, for another task, that's smart. Because here's the bottom line. This is... So technically, that means they're so technically they're non-union when they work for you because they're not working for you in the capacity that they are a union member. So would you be underpaid without the union as an actor? Absolutely. Absolutely, I'd be underpaid. I did a Toyota commercial this year, okay? And if I had done that in a non-union way, I would have been paid for the day and that would have been it. Whereas they're using my image over and over and over and over and over again. So since my image is still out there being used, I'm still getting paid on a quarterly basis, on a quarterly basis, because it's for web. But, you know, if, if I had done, like, there's a lot of, I've seen it like Mitsubishi commercials where they're looking for kid actors and they're like, I'm going to pay you $600 for the day and that's it. And then you see those kids out there forever which is just, it's just not fair. You know, you get, it's, that's not the way this works. You know, you get the benefit of the advantage of using that one particular thing for so long. And, and no, because that same 600 commercial, $600 commercial, if it were union would have been like a $20,000 commercial for a kid. And to make it worse, Let's say that a kid does that Mitsubishi commercial. They are now for like two to three years. While the whole time that Mitsubishi commercial is playing, they cannot be, they're under a non-compete. They can't be in a Toyota commercial. They can't be in a General Motors commercial. They can't be in anything else. Why isn't there another legal avenue for that? Because there is one with the unions. That's the way it is. It's, wor it's working for actors. And, and there are plenty, there's a lot of non-union work for actors so that they can get it and listen, it's great and get terrific, terrific, um, experience. But the reason that the unions exist was because people were abused on set, taken advantage of on set. Um, and people were making money off of the people who it was their original work. And, and that's why they exist. Safety. I mean, talk to the woman that got hit by the train. I mean, it's, that's why unions exist. Okay, well, I think, you know, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here. <laughs> I love the union! My, my uncle was actually a union negotiator. He had to go in and do negotiations. His name was Oliver. Isn't that a cool name, Oliver? Um, so, uh, any other, if there's no more questions, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm not mad at you, Charles. I actually want to hire you. I'm hoping you can fix my posters. <laughs> um, well, t uh, I think I'm going to take a break for the weekend. I don't know if Kat Kathy, are you going to be uh, scoping over the weekend? Thank you for those hearts. They're so beautiful. Purple's like one of my favorite colors in the whole world. Um, do Are you going to go over the weekend, Kathy? Are you going to do any scoping? I think I'm going to take a break. Oh, good. Excellent. Do you know what subject you're going to... Everybody f should follow Kathy. She's got more experience than I do. My, I can make you, oh, fabulous. That's really good. That's, I would love that. So definitely like, you know, let's DM me, man. 
That just sounds so dirty, doesn't it? DM me. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to be at DFW tomorrow. Oh, cool. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much for um, coming along. I have to fi figure out our, our subject for Monday. I'll Twitter when it's going to be this weekend, and I'll, and I'll let you know what the subject matter is going to be for Monday. But I thank you all for coming here, hanging out on a Friday night. Cheers to you all, and I'll see you again Monday. All right. Bye-bye, guys.